Hello, I am Adam Levine, Assistant Curator of European Art. Um, welcome to today's conversation. Before we start, I just want to acknowledge the land that the Art Gallery of Ontario operates on. It is the territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga Nation and was also the territory of the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the Federal Government of Canada and the Mississauga of the Credit Anishinaabe Nation. I am so excited to have Peter Brathwaite today uh, here in conversation with us. Peter is best known as an opera singer in London. He has performed across many of Europe's great stages, but like all of us, was housebound by the global pandemic. In March, Peter took up the Getty Museum's social media challenge to use costumes and props to create self-portraits as, as historic works of art. Peter chose a painting of a black servant by an unknown painter of the 1770s, and thus began a project he's pursued ever since, researching and creating historical depictions of black people in art. When I saw Peter's project, I wrote to him right away to ask if he'd participate in our conversations about our portrait of a lady holding an orange blossom. Peter is breathing new life into paintings of the past, and he's doing a lot of thinking about what these portraits mean in the present. Welcome, Peter. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I wonder just um, if we can start with your first creation, um, and I can um, share that up on the screen. And so I wonder, how did you choose this painting? So this was the first painting that I came across when I was um, looking for black portraiture in the search engine uh, at the time. And I'd seen various examples of the Getty Museum challenge. And I thought, well, maybe I should choose something that is uh, closer to me in appearance than some of the, the pieces that I, I've seen uh, replicated. So I, I saw this and was intrigued by the, the combination of objects and uh, the fact that there's a dog in the painting. And then I thought, what do I have in the wardrobe? What do we have in the, the dress up box? And um, what could I replace the dog with? And um, this was the Friday before Easter. So it was Good Friday and um, yeah, so I, I was just watching TV at the time and uh, thinking about the the jobs that I'd had cancelled and postponed and wondering what I was going to do with my time. And um, this seemed like a good thing to occupy my time with. It. Um, yeah, so uh, it's probably the least sophisticated of the um, recreations that I've done, but it, it's quite nice to look back at this first one and um, see it as a, a progression um, across the series uh, from here. Do you know anything about the subject? Not at all, no. Um, I, I'm really intrigued by the inclusion of glass in the, in the painting. Mm. Um, and I've since done a, a little bit of research into that and the, the juxtaposition of black skin against uh, the, the purity of glass. Uh, it was quite symbolic um, in paintings like this. And um, I, I think it has been suggested that he was likely uh, a favoured member of a, a household, um, uh, a favourite servant, and, and that's why he, he was painted in this way. Um, but like many of the pictures that I've recreated, there's a lot of mystery surrounding the subject. We've been really grappling with this mystery ourselves with, with the painting that we've just acquired. Um, mm. Because I think that the mystery is such a double-edged sword. It's exciting as a researcher with this desire to answer questions. Um, but it's also really not knowing is such a legacy of, of white supremacist history writing. Yes, you know, it, yeah, it of leaves, course. It leaves so many people with, with very little access to, um, to concrete details about ancestry or forebears. Mm. And I, you know, it, it's, 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 it's quite heartbreaking that, you know, mystery is sort of this not knowing is such an undercurrent of so many of the paintings that you reenact. 
Of course, and this was something that struck me when I, I first decided to do the project because I'd been looking at family tree research and ancestry and trying to piece together pieces of family history that I'd been told and that had been researched and I had no visual representation of, of these people and these names and I, I saw the parallels in in this very personal project and then this visual manifestation of black history and it's become in a way a, a, a process of trying to flesh out this history that I've been researching personally um, and also giving people the the chance to to think about these histories and think about the the absence and the absence in art history and the narratives that have been told and um, who tells our history and yeah why voices have been marginalized and um, and whitewashed so it's become a, a really personal mission for me in in that respect i think it's you know when i when i think about um erasures one thing that is really striking is that many of the paintings that you've featured have been on display in museums for many many decades and the black figures in them have were rendered invisible because the their the museums that hold these paintings have never done research into their identities don't make no. reference to them with their with their wall text um, even when a portrait is you know when a painting is named um, as a portrait of the white person in the painting and it yes. only it's the fact that there is a black person in the painting at all it makes mm. even internet search terms it makes it very difficult to, <laughs> yes you know and i that that seems sort of silly but i actually think that you know the capacity to search on the internet for these figures it, you know it, it's a huge research tool um and so Definitely, when museums yeah. don't acknowledge their presence it makes it, it it makes it as if they're not there of course and and that's what i found in developing the project is that I've had to be really creative and use my imagination to find many of these images and I've been grateful to um, people who blog about black sitters in art and uh, there are some great blogs that have reams and reams of paintings that I, I'd never seen before and some of these paintings were known to me but the majority are, I'm encountering for the first time and if you have to go through all of that just to find these images, something is definitely not right. And um, redressing that balance is something that I'm really determined to contribute towards now. And um, I hope that by doing this, other people, the, the audiences uh, are encouraged to um, search for themselves and join this mission to, um, think about how we catalogue art and uh, how it is um, spoken about and the histories that are told and and how we can collectively put flesh on these bones and um, fill out these histories that have been neglected for such a long time. Mm. I The next image that I want to show, um, I just think is, is, this is such a um, artful exercise, the, this particular recreation, because you've created a, por uh, a portrait of the, um, of the actor Ira Aldridge as Othello. And when I was looking at your project, it occurred to me that as an opera singer, much of your work involves wearing costume and inhabiting mm -hmm. historical identities. And I wonder if you've played um, uh, black characters in historical operas before? and if those roles have offered a similar space for sort of exploring blackness in history? Yeah, within the, the first five years of graduating, I played a slave twice um, in two different operas. And this was unusual for me. And, and when the opportunities arose, I obviously I had to think about it and whether this was something I, I wanted to do. but actually I found them hugely rewarding because um, like the family tree research, I've come to black history through my own personal research into 
uh, my own past, but also the the colonial past that I inhabit and is in, it's part of me. Um, and having the opportunity to work through this and consider it uh, from a performance perspective is hugely um, emotional, firstly, um, but also allows the, the same opportunity as with the, the paintings to um, create real characters, real people, rather than caricatures. And yeah. I think that's something that we see a lot of in the, the paintings. Um, and specifically with the Donizetti opera that I, I sang in, I sang the role of Kaidema in Il Furioso alla Isola di San Domingo, which um, is set in San Domingo, uh, Caribbean island, um, during the period of enslavement. And this character uh, historically has been portrayed as the, the comic buffo character, uh, as a, a comic device and was often performed in blackface. Um, so performing it was trying to move beyond this heritage and create something that the audience could consider the humanity of this this person um, and move away from the idea of a black character or person as an exotic um, device in a piece of art. So, um, yeah, I, I found by doing it, the the audience response firstly was, oh, this, this is quite a, a complex character. <laughs> um, uh, it's There's nuance there. And, and actually Donizetti uses quite tricky music um, for, for Kaidema. Uh, how he's composed the role is, is full of complexity. And um, I think he was aware of the complexities of, of plantation life himself and the hierarchy that existed um, in the slave society. Um, and artists have always been responding to this and and that's what we see in the visual art and we see it in music as well so having the opportunity to to sing a, a character an enslaved african uh was uh an, an honor in a way because um i've been able to connect with this history in um a, a, a tangible way i'm so struck by the you know you sort of um reclaiming a character that was was performed as a, a white actor in blackface for mm. for many years and and i think relatedly it occurred to me that many or most of the paintings that you're recreating and inhabiting are black subjects through the gaze of a white artist yes and this whole your your entire project is in so many ways about um, reclaiming or reauthoring narratives of blackness, um, yes. it feels extremely restorative and quite just that mm. you know after you know it's such a survey of of white looking at blackness. Yes, and you're you're just taking it right right back. <laughs> yeah, and, and that that's really empowering for me to be able to to look at a painting and know that this is viewed through white gaze, created um, at a distance and uh, often without any consideration for really what is happening in, in the mind of the, the sitter or um, the, the life of the sitter, really. Um, and trying to give these people some dignity and um, and allow their stories to be told and allow people today to connect with them. And um, we, we know that black people were seen as chattel, as, as commodities. And um, yeah, so this is for me a, a very um, personal mis mission to to create real lives and um, and show that black lives do matter and and 
I think art is hugely powerful and influential, and, and we, we see this through the, the censorship that um, art has been subject to, and um, people recognize the power of art to, to change and influence, and, and so restoring this and platforming it is uh, a way of um, providing another route into this history and um, and into activism as well. I have been really struck by the objects that you've used and the costume materials that you've used in order to recreate the works that you've you've recreated. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit about where you find these materials. I noticed that sometimes you use um, modern commercial products mm. um, and you often make allusions to colonization and to African diaspora cultures. Are these products you already had at home? Um, in the image that I'm showing, you have uh, your grandfather's cuckoo stick and I, I really, I would love to learn more about um, <laughs> about the whole the material process behind your portraits yeah so i i use things that are in the house here with me and they are either objects that i use on a day-to-day -day basis like hair products or uh, foodstuffs and specifically i've been keen to use caribbean foodstuffs that i have around the home um, and Afro hair products and and things that relate to to my my heritage, my past, and um, and then there are the items that are heirlooms and they're humble items. They're, they're folk items. I have the the quilt that my grandmother made hanging behind me uh, here in my music room, and also I've used the cuckoo stick as you mentioned. Um, and that is a cooking implement. It's used to stir the national dish of Barbados, which is a bit like polenta. It's made from ground cornmeal um, and is mixed with okra or ladies' fingers um, into a, a sort of paste. And it, it's quite stiff and uh, you need quite a bit of strength to, <laughs> to stir it and, and mold it. Um, and I... I really value these two items, the quilt and the cuckoo stick, because they're uh, such personal objects and significant objects to my family and um, our past. Um, and it's been quite fun to elevate them and give them lives of their own. And uh, they've taken on personalities in, uh, <laughs> in a way that lots of people have been saying they should have their own Twitter accounts or um, Instagram accounts, which is yeah, quite, quite amusing. And amusing for my mum to see because she's grown up with these things and they were just part of her, her day to day. Um, but the inclusion of objects like this and uh, Caribbean foodstuffs, everyday objects has been part of the process of subversion and um, trying to turn these images upside down and uh, replace high with low and um, really get beneath the, the veneer, the gloss, the, um, the, the pristineness of, of many of the images. And um, yeah, so that, that's been fun to play with and also interesting then to see the conversations that um, occur uh, between objects um, mm -hmm. when you place them together and, and that's always fun when it's unexpected and it's something that you didn't really um, consider when you were curating and um, placing together and um, agonizing over how to replace a certain object and um, there, there's a moment when <laughs> Uh, in a painting like the Past and Treasure, for instance, which is a, uh, a huge collection of, of riches. Um, and when I was creating my version and laid all of the individual objects that I collected from around the house um, on the table, that it was 
to me it, it felt really noisy it was as if they were all screaming and, and shouting and vibrating um, and there's something quite musical about curating these images um, you are composing you are creating music you are singing a score and um, interpreting it in um, the same way that I'd, I'd pick up a, an opera score and and read through it for the first time and um, so that's been yeah, great to to keep in touch with with that process as well and um, and using these objects to to find the essence of um, of, of performance in a way. My uh, my family is from Puerto Rico, and I have a tostonera, which is a right. a, a wooden cooking implement from my grandmother. Um, that yes, I I you know I have a very similar emotional relationship to what you've described mm. with the cuckoo stick. And um, I've been thinking a lot lately because I've been looking at it a lot in quarantine um, and holding it a lot. I, I don't know. It's yes. just sort of around in, in my psyche a lot. And um, it occurs to me that uh, objects like that were not intended to be kept the way that you and I have kept them. No. Um, and it feels quite radical to um, to to hold on to something that is sort of assigned low value, um, mm. and to treasure it, and yes. and um, and to refuse to part with it or replace it. You know, I just yeah. I, there's just it, it feels um, so sacred to hold on to these materials and to keep using them. Yeah, definitely, and uh, I I think about my ancestors and they wouldn't have time to to <laughs> consider these items they they were uh utilized and um you know they were thinking about trying to get from one day to the next and um but actually taking a step back from them and giving them space is a really useful way of considering the, the history and and allowing that history to to speak and um, for people to, to hear it. I read in the caption that you posted for this uh, recreation that the songbook that you've um, placed in the background is Caribbean mm. music. Yes. Yeah, so it's a book of Barbadian folk songs that I I picked up on a, a, a trip to Barbados about three years ago now, and I, I've only recently started delving into it, and it's full of really... <laughs> um yeah just gems basically and um i've been using lockdown to to learn some of these songs and get to know them and just think about the folk tradition and the oral tradition and what it means to comment on your day-to-day -day, your lived experience through music through song and this is something that is a a key part of Bajan culture and Caribbean culture um, and when much of your uh, culture has been removed and taken away or suppressed uh, something that remains is always the uh, the ability to sing um, and to communicate that way so learning these songs and getting to know them and including them in these images um, yeah has been um, a, a process of discovery for me because I'm seeing the, the layers in the songs and uh, their potential and um, and also considering the power of music, um, especially at a time when um, I'm silenced in a way um, because of the, the pandemic and, um, and my music making and uh, making music here at home. Um, is such a, a, a key um, characteristic of my, my, my day and my existence at the moment. And uh, the intimacy of, of singing songs like that is, um, yeah, very different in, in scale to, to opera. Um, mm. But they're all little operas, they're, they're little vignettes. And, and that's what the images have become to me as well. Are there any songs in the book that you knew through family or are they all discoveries? 
there's one song about Coco Tea that I, I'd, I'd heard my, my sister sing and my mum sing, but I'd never really engaged with it. Um, mm. And it turns out that they, they all have different interpretations of, of the text and um, what the words are. <laughs> so uh, it, it's been tricky to decipher um, what the song actually is about. Um, but I, I, I'm taking the book as the de definitive version here. So um, yeah, it, it's been uh, funny to to sing the song back to them and, and see what they think about um, the words that I, <laughs> I'm, I'm singing. Um, but yeah, I, I'm learning a lot of these songs for the first time. And um, what's great is that there, there are children's songs, there are um, songs about work, there are songs about um, relationships and, yeah. and yeah, oh, the 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 full gamut of of human experience. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have to share this image because we've actually talked about Francois Marpart de Beaucourt's painting of Marie Therese Zimmer before in our series on Portrait right. of a Lady Holding an Orange Blossom, um, and and so I was really struck that you. Um, um, inhabited her, and also um, Dido Bell's portrait by mm. David Martin. These are the sort of really two guiding images that we've been thinking about as, um, um, you know, they're from the same exact decade as the painting that, that we have at the AGO and that we're studying. Um, and, and, you know, the three of them all sort of put together represent, um, uh, you know, a a really sort of astounding breadth of different possible experiences of uh, yeah. of lives for mm. black women in the 1770s um, yes. as colonial subjects. Um, yeah. And so I, I can't get over this image. It's just wonderful. Um, you know, I love specifically that um, you have uh, used canned pineapple um, as um, an avatar for the pineapple itself. Um, you know, I think a lot about um, how the Caribbean has been exported um, yes. through colonization and um, and the sort of refined uh, pineapple in sugar hmm. syrup is maybe, I, I don't know if there's a better symbol for the ways that the plants um, of, the, of the islands have, have been made accessible and consumable for the empire. Mm. Um, one thing I wonder is with, with images like the, the portrait of Marie-Thérèse Zemir and Dido Bell, when you know a portrait's, you know, the, the, the subject's name and a bit about their biography, mm. do you feel a special pressure to do their lives and legacies justice? I tend to treat them the same as uh, an anonymous figure. Um, of course, having biographical details is a, a gold mine in, in terms of um, yeah the, the rarity of that experience and, and reading details and having a name. Um, but yeah, actually, I when I look at the images, I'm it's usually the same process for each image, it's, it's researching the, um, the composition and uh, the facial expression and um, trying to get behind that because um, I, I'm also uh, a bit wary of trusting biographical details as well because yeah. like the images they, they come through um, white gaze and um, so I'm, I'm trying to decipher my, my gut reaction to the image um, when I'm um, working on a, a reconstruction or portrayal. Um, but of course with with these specific images depicting women um, whose names we, we know um, are often key to understanding the, the hierarchy that existed in the Caribbean and slave societies. 
Um, and for me, this relates to my Barbadian heritage and Barbados was the, the blueprint, the, the testing ground for, um, for slave societies. And, and the model there was rolled out across the Americas. Um, and um, it was where the idea of whiteness was uh, formalized and uh, was written about and uh, books on, on this were exported. And um, I did a, a Brunias painting, uh, mm. uh, a recreation of the Barbados mulatto um, go and and this image encapsulates that it, it's um the the mixed race woman at the center of the image um and her head is just below the uh, plantation house which is uh, way off in the distance and then there are, are two uh fully black women enslaved women um one below her on the floor and the other standing next to her wearing um, a bondage slave collar. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the symbolism here is, is so great and relates directly to the image of Dido Bell and, and the image you have in, in your collection as well. Um, um, and these are the images that were being fed to European audiences. Um, and, and this is how um, the idea of um, of white supremacy was was peddled, and um, and and yeah. So uh, I really I, I see these images as moving uh, together in in the same way, and. Um, it's quite a crucial moment and also the representation of women um, and the history of, of, of enslaved women who were often raped and forced to have children and um, and yeah it's a, a really brutal period of history um, depicted in in quite a, a, a glossy way um, and yeah, when we see the image of, of Dido Bell, I, I think on, on the surface, it appears to be um, playful and, and delightful. And, um, but actually, we're seeing something that is um, truly political. Um, and, and we know that the version of Dido Bell and her history that is so widely consumed today mm. is is um, grossly whitewashed. Um, yeah. You know that um, there's it's you know so popular to think of her in her in Kenwood House and you know sort of um, moving happily amongst her her family as if as if racial difference doesn't exist and and we you know we know from historical documentation that that's not at all what her life was like. Um, yeah. I find, you know, the, the, this image, uh, Malpar's painting is, mm, I think one of the paintings I find hardest to look at um, of, of enslavement because mm. it, knowing the relationship between subject and painter, it strikes me that every single paintbrush, paint stroke is an act of domination. Yes. Yeah. You know, and 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 it even really, you know, I, I bristle at calling this a portrait because it because she really, you know, she's been she's made to function as a trope as much, yes. you know, and um, and it, it, yeah, I mean, I'm struck by the fact that um, you know, in some ways, you're recuperating a bit of agency. You don't bury your breast in the same way that uh, mm. that she's made to. Um, yeah. One thing I wonder is um, just about the gender performance of mm. you know, of you inhabiting um, uh, black women in your yeah. project. Um, you know what what um, um, drag doesn't seem like really the right word. Um, exactly. You know, I wonder sort of um, how you explore 
the identities of black women as a black man through this project? Yeah, it's it's strange because it, it's never a leap of faith or um, it doesn't really cross my mind that I'm recreating a portrait of um, a woman. It, it, it doesn't seem unusual for me um, and I'm not sure whether that's because I'm a performer um, and I'm, I'm used to singing music and songs from um, all perspectives um, and I think originally when I recreated Dial Your Bell's image it was because I was intrigued by the story of my grandmother, my, my fourth great grandmother, who was a mixed race woman, um, the daughter of a plantation owner and an enslaved African woman, um, and was born around the 1770s, 1780. Um, and the fact that because of her mixed race, heritage she was part of uh, the elite uh, the mixed race elite in Barbados um, and that marked her out um, her skin color um, yeah this this history is something that is is still with us and we we see colorism still today in um, former colonies and uh, the Americas as a result of this um, these hierarchies that were uh, created um, in the colonies and uh, and that was my reason for for wanting to depict Dido Bell uh, because I, I saw lots of parallels with um, the life of my, my grandmother um, so I, I suppose the the other thing is wanting to have a, a uh, a range of images represented in the project and, of course. Um, and different voices heard um, and I, I think I would be leaving out a huge part of this uh, this this history this heritage of, of, of art um, if I didn't uh, depict women in, in my my recreations of course you know um, I think um... I've, I've certainly been thinking since we acquired a, the portrait of a lady holding an orange blossom about ways that we can make this painting um, available and um, current and sort of alive in this moment. And mm. I haven't seen uh, an initiative quite like yours that that does this in such tangible and meaningful and palpable ways. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, so I wonder, have you thought about the responsibilities of museums to celebrate and elevate black histories? You know, you mentioned that you've sort of had to rely on um, tumblers and Pinterests and, you know, uh, yeah. blogs um, to find these images. And so I wonder what, you know, and institutions around the world, arts institutions around the world are sort of uh, doing a lot of navel gazing and trying to really tear themselves apart and rebuild in a way that um, is fundament are fundamentally anti-racist. So, mm. you know, have you thought about um, how would this project have gone differently if, you know, if uh, museum resources were different or, or what would you like to see when you come to visit any of these paintings after uh, the pandemic, you know, to see them in person? Yeah, uh, I, I'd like to see clear labeling, cataloging, um, and I'd like to know that you don't have to be an art historian uh, or an expert to be able to access these paintings. It it would be great if um, anyone could find uh, these paintings and that they were uh integrated into the, the the mainstream the the main body of the, the canon of art that we know um and I, I think it's about museums opening their 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 doors to this and um and presenting uh 
the facts and and the history and being transparent about, about history and um and where stories haven't been told uh working out how they can fill the blanks and um work to to redress that and um i i think a lot of it has to do with with mindset and uh, when I'm thinking about these images and this project, I'm thinking about decolonizing the images. And, and to that, uh, to me, that means um, giving voice to these sitters and um, allowing people to, to access history um, in uh, uh, an, an easier way than um, than you know, having to do a lot of digging and um, this work becoming uh, ghettoized as a as a result of of being marginalised and and that's the the last thing we want to happen. It, we don't want this to be um, only found in um, exhibitions about black art. We we want to see how it fits into um, the broad sweep of history um, and see the connections and um and yeah i i think that's really important to work out yeah who were the contemporaries and um why was this specific sitter painted in london at this time was there a black community living in this part of the city or um and it's um yeah, these details that allow us to have uh, uh, a real grasp of history and and art history as well. Um, Peter, thank you so much. This has been really, really fascinating. No, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope it's um, yeah, I, it, it's made sense. <laughs> it's funny to to sort of talk about these things when. Yeah, I, I've spent so much time in my own head looking at, at these images and um, running around the house grabbing um, Father Christmas costumes and, and various other things. <laughs> um, but. Well, no, it's been wonderful and, and um, I really enjoy your project and, um, and we'll certainly uh, link to it below so that people can, um, can check out your project uh, as it, oh, thank as it you. develops. Um, and yeah, and uh, I hope that I'll be able to welcome you to the AGO sometime in the future and we can visit the portrait of a lady together. Yeah, I'd, I'd love that. That'd be great. Um, yeah, I, I thought about whether I could recreate it. Um, it's quite a tricky one. <laughs> We've been working with costume historians for, for many months to try to really understand exactly yeah. uh, what she's wearing. And so, um, mm. so, so we'll, we'll, we'll give you some tips. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thanks very much.